Okay, this is part one of two sessions I'm going to do on generative AI and the travel industry. So part one, I'm going to go into a little bit about how generative AI came about, what it is, what it isn't, how it works. This is really important. A lot of, a lot of mistakes people are making with this stuff is because they don't understand how it works and they have uh, expectations that they um, that they should understand. And it's not actually that difficult to understand the basics. So I'm going to cover that in this session, probably around half an hour. And then the second half of it, I'm going to go through some practical applications on how to use this stuff. So generative AI is a type of AI. It already started through a game like this, which sounds really simple. And it is really simple in, in, a, certain, in a certain view. And it's just guess the next word of the following words. And this is how this stuff came about. This is how generative AI works. And this is why it's been such a revolution today. So I'm pretty sure this is the biggest thing. Is, is a bigger, this is bigger than the internet and mobile. Some people say it's the biggest thing since the printing press, the wheel, the fire, whatever you may or may not agree with. It's probably the biggest thing in most of our lifetimes, I think. This all started with this paper in 2017. So AI has been around a few decades. You'll hear lots of people saying, we've been doing AI for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Lots of companies like to say that. Some companies have. Google, I think, said they were AI first in 2015. Google is an AI company. But a lot of people actually like to say they've been using AI and, and really haven't been. This is the first time any kind of AI has been accessible to most people. And it's the first time, really, where AI became useful to 99.9% .9 of the world. Previous to this point, it was good at building engines for research and <clears throat> powering Google, looking at big data, that kind of thing. But previous to this point, most AI just didn't work or was unusable. So when they made this paper in 2017 by a bunch of Google researchers, don't worry about the details of it, this revolutionized the world as far as AI. And this came out in with ChatGPT, which is owned by OpenAI, in November 22. And at the point it came out, nobody expected this, except for a few people within OpenAI. But no one expected this to be as good as it was. No one expected this to create this revolution. Even the people that built this were shocked about how well this stuff worked. So it really was a step change. And it's the first time AI became accessible to most of us and became useful to most of us. So what does generative AI means? Basically, it means that the computer can now understand English language. When I say English language, I just mean language. It understands all languages. These things are can, can understand language as a factor of how much data they've been trained on. There's most, uh, most of the world's data is English or the English makes up the large, largest portion of the world's data. So it speaks the best English. After that, I think it's probably Spanish, then French, then German, whatever it is. The hundredth most popular language in the world, it's not going to be anywhere near as good a quality. So it speaks our language. And if I say English in this session, I may just mean language. Sometimes you might think, well, hang on a second, that, what, what's such a big deal? We all speak English, it's not that hard. What, what's, the, what's the big deal? But now we have access to the world's computers, all this compute with hundreds and thousands of computers that can do all of this processing just by speaking to it. So previously to use a computer, you have to program the computer. And to program a computer, you have to tell it exactly what you want it to do. And you need to have obviously skills in coding and you're giving it a specific instruction on what to build and how to build it. Now we can have conversations back and forth, just like you will with another human, but you're having a conversation with a computer with all of this compute behind it and all this information behind it. So when you start thinking through, it does revolutionize the world. A couple of technicalities. GPT is the type of AI. So GPT stands for generative. Generative meaning it creates content. It can create answers and essays and, and images and all kinds of th stuff. I'm going to focus on text right now. So it can create text in multiple languages. It's pre-trained. I'll get into this in a second, but it's read the world's information. 
Transformers uh, technical doesn't matter that much, but it stores everything in terms of numbers, in terms of vector databases, which are numbers. So it converts tokens, which is like a piece of a word, into numbers, and then it converts it back to words for us to read. That bit's not important for most people. LLM is something I'll use a lot. LLM is the large language model. That's the brain that you end up with once you've trained this thing. So when you speak to an LLM, that's speaking to a, a, a generative AI model or a large language model. So how to create an LLM, a large language model. Um, you're not going to create one of these if you're watching this video. Most likely the largest tech companies in the world are creating these brains. They're very expensive. takes a very long time. You need thousands or hundreds of thousands of computers or these chips. These chips are $30,000 each. I saw a report last week, Meta or Facebook has $100 billion worth of these chips that for training their next model. So how to train these models? First of all, you gather the world's information. So the rumor has it that OpenAI or ChatGPT trained on 10 trillion words, which is most of the words that are out there. So it's read all of Wikipedia, most of the books in the world, most of the scientific papers, most websites, you end up with 10 trillion words. You then need this supercomputer, which you train a little bit on what you expect it to do, but you need this super fancy computer, which is lots of chips all plugged together. And then you start training. So day one, you play this game with the computer. So Monday morning, you show up, say to the computer, okay, I'm gonna feed you a word and I want you to guess what the next word is. Computer says, fine. So day one, you say, grizzly, what's the next word? Potato. No, that's actually not the word we're looking for. We're looking for the word bears. It says, okay, let me remember that. And you say, what's the next word? And it says, sausages. And you say, no, we're looking for the word like. What's the next one? Pink. No, we're looking for the word too. It gets all of these wrong for the first, whatever, first few thousand or few hundred thousand guesses, just gets them all wrong. It's never seen these words in its life, but it remembers what the answer was. Turns out then after a few thousand of these and you give it six or seven words at a time over and over and over again, it starts to learn the patterns. So next time it sees the word grizzly, it thinks, well, I've seen this before, let me try bears again. And it turns out that was correct this time. And it starts to learn what the next likely words based on the words before it and the words after it. And it turns out, and this is what no one actually knew was going to happen, if you do this for 10 trillion words and you remember all the answers, you could speak perfect English. And that's all this stuff is. It remembers, it, it, it's, it's generating the next word, the next word, the next word based on the words before it. And that's how you can speak perfect English. And this was the amazing piece for most of these developers. They, they, they saw this happening a little bit with previous versions of, G of GPT, which didn't really work and they were clunky and not very usable. And then they got to this point with GPT-3 where they trained on tr 10 trillion words and it spat out perfect English. So now you've got this, you've got this raw LLM. So now you can ask it all these things and it can give you answers back. The problem then is if you release this to the world, everyone just goes straight to how to break this thing. And everyone immediately tries to create a nuclear bomb and it will, it'll give you detailed instructions on how to build a nuclear bomb and how to get hold of materials. And it'll, it can go through all of that if you want it to. So we don't want that. Also, people ask it, you know, what are the 100 best things that Hitler did? And it will give you the 100 things that Hitler did. We don't want that either. We also want it to be able to speak in a certain format and, and be kind of friendly and work in a certain tone. So they spend a few months with humans answering questions, giving it these guardrails and making sure it responds in a way that we want it to respond. That's introducing bias, absolutely. But from talking to people who've tried these, not talking to people, from listening to people who've tried these things, these raw LLMs you can't release to the world. It will just spit out information that we don't want being out there in the world. So these guardrails are built so that they're usable for humans and sensible and productive for humans. So once they've done that, now trained it, which is called fine tuning also, for a few months, then they release this to the world and you end up with a, with a thing like this, which is the model, which is the LLM. So this is this thing which now knows everything, 
but actually it remembers nothing. So each time you speak to this LLM, like chat GPT, it's forgotten that you exist. A lot of people think, well, hang on a second, I've used chat GPT and, and you, you're in a thread and it does remember the previous thread. It actually doesn't. Every time you hit enter, it's sending the summary of the thread above that as a new question. And that's quite important concept. So it's each time you interact, it's you're brand new to it. But there are hacks like sending the previous information. So it knows everything within reason and it remembers nothing. So you interact with these things like most people have done through this prompt or this chat bot, which is how this stuff was introduced. So you ask it a question, it responds, ask it a follow up, it responds with more. They're getting quite, ni quite nice now at responding with certain formats and that kind of thing. But this is how you talk to the LLM. And this is free for anyone to use. This is ChatGPT. So the largest tech companies in the world are building these, except for Apple. We don't quite know what Apple are doing right now. Um, the most famous of these is OpenAI's ChatGPT. And OpenAI are in partnership now with Microsoft. Microsoft's version of this is called Copilot. So OpenAI slash Microsoft generally seen as the leaders in and definitely have been up to this point in generative AI. But now there are three other models which are getting very similar as far as quality. One of them is Google Gemini. It seems that when ChatGPT came out, Google were taken a bit by surprise by it. They've had to work really quickly in the last 15 months to catch up and looks like maybe they've mostly caught up, probably not quite, but they're getting there. Uh, Llama um, is a model by Meta or Facebook. They have their own. Theirs is open source, which is kind of interesting for most people. Maybe kind of not. Open source means you can take their model, you can adapt it, you can download it to your computer and do things with it. For 99.99% of people, that's that's not useful. We just want a model that we can chat with. But Facebook's is open source. You could chat with that today on Facebook Messenger within um, Facebook or within Instagram. And then Anthropic is another company, which is now part owned by Amazon. Um, also very similar. Anthropic Claude is their model. This stuff gets really complicated with everyone having different models and different names and etc. And then Mistral is actually a French company. Who would have thunk it? French company up there with these other models. It's also open source. Um, but mostly for people, if you want to use this stuff today, I recommend ChatGPT, if not Gemini or Anthropic. But these are the biggest companies. You're not training your own model. These things cost hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars to create. So you're going to use a third party software, which is generally going to be one of these companies. So what's it good at? And what's it not good at? I actually think what, it, what it's not good at is more important to understand. Hallucinations, I think everyone's heard now. And this is when it makes something up. And the problem with the hallucinations with these models is it speaks very confidently. So you can't tell when it's completely made something up. It's definitely getting better over time but they're still there. So you can never 100% trust what these models are spitting out, which sounds like a terrible thing, and it kind of is. But once you learn why and when it hallucinates, it's actually much easier to deal with. So if you're asking it for the top 100 things to do in San Francisco, it'll give you a list of 100 things to do. It'll be perfect. Not perfect for everyone, but it'll be a really good list. If you ask it for 100 things to do in some town 200 miles east of here in the desert, it will create 100 things. But there's actually only four things to do in that town. It's going to make up 96. And the problem is you can't differentiate when it's made them up versus when it hasn't. And that the reason it does that is because it's always, always the best probability of the next word. So when you go into San Francisco, it's got really good choices. It's 96% sure that the next best word is this, and it's going to say Golden Gate Bridge and palace of fine arts and it speaks it's it knows with confidence when you go to this town in the middle of nowhere here it's choosing really low percentage words but it's the five percent most likely next best word is better than the four percent one so let's choose the five percent still probably going to be wrong but it doesn't know it's wrong it's just guessing the next word kind of weird but that's the way it is and that's why these things hallucinate although it's actually much much better than it was a year ago and if you know when to look for it, it's not generally a problem. 
the other thing is these are not really fact engines so they also haven't got current information even though there are now hacks and it can browse to find information but like i said before these train on say 10 trillion words and then they stop so they give it all this data they then fine tune it and then they release it so it's only got information on the training information only got data from that training cutoff date which is why they don't have access to yesterday's football results Sounds like a problem, but it's actually not. The, the power in these things is that they understand language. It's not a fact database. If you want to know the football results, there are websites for that. If you want the latest news, there are websites for that. The, the fact that they speak English, and you can converse with them in your language, is the most important thing. That's also changing because they're doing hacks now where if they haven't got the answer, they can go and browse and find the answer and that kind of thing. The third thing they're not good at, which is weird also, is numbers. Calculators have been brilliant for the last 50 whatever years, 70 years. Everyone assumes that computers can just do numbers, and they can, but large language models are not as good at numbers. And they're pretty actually simple. Like I said before, they're trained on human language. They're trained on words, not numbers. So when you ask it for two plus two, that's fine. It's seen that in words a million times, no problem. When you ask it for 474 times 6.94, it's got very little chance actually they could do that now because they've given it kind of extra training but initially it wasn't able to do those numbers so these aren't going to replace your calculator your spreadsheet if you're doing complex financial sheets on on excel generative ai is not the place to go and to go and apply that to right now spreadsheets are fantastic at doing that this is for english language or for language so what they're good at is they speak perfect English or perfect language. So they never make grammatical mistakes. It also understands perfect language. It will never come back. If you speak proper language to it, it will never come back and say, I don't understand. It might give you the wrong answer, but it will always understand what you mean. It knows everything. It's read, don't forget, everything pretty much out there. So it's read all the Wikipedia, all the scientific data. It's gone through. Don't forget, it's not saving information in a database. It doesn't know where it's read anything. So when you ask it, how long is the Golden Gate Bridge? It knows how long the Golden Gate Bridge is because it's read it in a million different places. It doesn't know where it's read that because it only remembers one word at a time. So some people get confused and think that it's got this, this database of stored information and it's going back to ask the answer. It's not, it's doing the next word, next word, next word. So it knows everything because it's read everything, but it has no context as to where it read anything. Best thing, it has infinite patience, never complains. You can ask it the same question over and over and over and iterate a tiny bit until you get the right response and it will never complain. Doesn't need a break. Fantastic thing about this stuff is to, to communicate with these LLMs, you don't need developers. The, actually, developers are not going to help you one bit when you're just communicating. What you need is to be able to speak clear language. Um, if you're building applications, if you're building tools with this stuff, you do need developers to plug that into your website and to create UXs and that kind of thing. But if you're just chatting on ChatGPT or on Gemini and creating content using that developers are not going to help you and actually talking like a developer is probably going to give you a less valuable result the best prompting the best way to communicate is just to use very clear concise language so text content ideas business plans these are fantastic at business plans they're really creative don't forget it's read everything before so it's got all these different ideas from different areas it understands the travel industry, absolutely, but it also understands other industries. So whereas humans, we get very biased, we're naturally very biased, but we also end up living in this little echo chamber. Sometimes there's great ideas from other industries that we don't actually apply that we should, and this stuff can, because it's not got our bias, it's not looking at one particular niche. It's really good at writing things like blogs and articles. At Magpie, we use it for product descriptions. I'll, I'll go through that in a second. You can plug in a 20-page PDF and ask it to summarize it in 10 words or one page or whatever you want. Chatbots, really good application. You can have now conversations back and forth, 
put a chat button on your website. Everyone's going to have AI chatbots on the website. You can create email responses and review responses. Email response is now part of Gmail. There's, there's tools to do that. I think we all need to be really careful when we're, com when we're communicating with other humans that they understand. If, we, if you're using AI for that, which I don't think you should right now, but if you are, I think you need to be really careful that people understand that it was generated by AI. Same with the chatbot. Don't put a chatbot on your website and pretend it's a human if it's not. It's definitely the way to upset people. At Magpie, we do review response, so we generate a good response to review, but I always tell people, make sure you read it every time before you send it. So product description is one of the first tools we built at Magpie. We take an awful product description, badly written, not a lot of time spent on it, and we create a really good description, which is built to convert. This takes a bit more work because we're, we're formatting that in different areas for OTAs, that kind of thing, but it's all using GPT behind the scenes to take an awful description and create a great one. This was one of my sort of aha moments. Um, for those that don't know me, I spent most of my life in San Francisco running the Hop on a Path um, sightseeing tours. So I understand as well as anybody on the planet, there's probably two of us that understand as well as anybody on the planet, how to run Hop on a Path in San Francisco. And very early using ChatGPT, I asked that these five prompts. So. I like to tell people, and I'll go more into this in, in part two, where I'll go into some practical applications. But when you're prompting these things, if you're making things like plans, which it's really good at, I like to start very broad because you brought that bias with you. So if you ask it very specific questions, you bring in bias when it might actually send you in a different direction. So this is an example of five prompts. Starting very broad, create me a 10-part business plan. It's going to create a perfect outline of a business plan. It's going to be financial, marketing, sales, operations, all the parts you'd expect in a business plan. Then I take one of those and drill down. Obviously, you can pick any one you want. So take the marketing plan, create an outline of that. Take one aspect of the marketing plan, social marketing, create an outline of that and keep drilling down and down and down. And it knows every single part of this business. If I went deep into operations and ask it to make routes and places to see and come up with scripts and everything, it can do all of that. And in this example, I ended up asking it for 10 actual posts for Instagram. So on the left is the start prompt. On the right is five prompts later. It's I've already created 1,600 words and eight pages. It's not about how many pages, but it's the quality. But this is creating the first 10 Instagram posts leading up to the launch of this tour in San Francisco. You can read this if you like, but the first post is silhouette of a bus against the skyline at sunset as the launch, as the pre-launch is actually really clever. Next day is the logo on a, on a background. It's come up with some really good posts on how potentially to launch this company. So that's just an idea of how to go through different stages and create business plans. Just one way to use this text model. I love the slide because it looks like the worst, the most boring slide, and it kind of is, but I kind of find it the most interesting. So, and this is looking forward to how AI is going to affect the world. My guess is as good as anybody's, but there's some certain concepts which I think are important for us to understand because they are going to affect, this is going to affect everybody. So data compression, when you wake up in the morning, you start compressing data. You, obviously, you start with your Instagram in the morning and you go through your feed and you, you're taking in data. Maybe you read a blog post because you're getting into work mode. You read some emails, you're consuming data, you're remembering stuff, you're forgetting most of it because we're human, but you're consuming data. You drive to work, you listen to a podcast, some business marketing concept. You're thinking, okay, let me take that and I'll apply it to that. You get a, to a marketing meeting, you now compressed all this data in your brain and now you start speaking, which is you compressing it, giving out to somebody else. Jenny, I saw this great thing on how to do posts for Instagram, which we should apply. Hey, Bobby, I saw this thing today on, on the double-decker bus routes, we should be building them this way instead of that way. So you're compressing that and giving it to other people. You could be talking, you could be speaking that, you could be emailing it, you could be messaging it, you're communicating that with other people. 
they are sitting there compressing data. They've read the blog post in the morning and listened to a podcast and watched a video. They're listening to your words. They're compressing that so they can now create an email to send to somebody else. We're all taking in data, compressing it, and handing it to the next person, communicating it to the next person until finally we take action on it and actually do something, create that Instagram post. Now, all of that was done via text. It might be audio, might be video, but it's all done with human language. And now the computer can do data compression better than we can. We're forgetting 99% of what we consume. And we have to because our brains, our brains do that because it's actually more efficient to forget most of the junk that we see. But we try and remember the most important bits. But the computer remembers everything because we also forget important bits. So task by task, the computers are getting better than us at our jobs for a lot of people, for people especially that use laptops at work. So the other part of all this AI, these other models do multimodal. So now I can create an image using a text. So I can say, create an image of a bus going over the Golden Gate Bridge. It's going to come out with three images. This was awful a year ago. It's generally really good now. It's definitely not perfect, but you can create really good realistic images today on a few different models. You can also input an image and ask it to describe that image. Text to audio has been happening for a while. Type in some text, create a voice from that text. The voices today are as good as a human. I say as good as a human. You can't tell the difference between a computer generated voice and a human most of the time. And then audio to text, you've seen this for quite a while. These are the bots that show up on your Zoom calls. They're recording the audio and they're creating a transcript. So now I think most people know you can bring an audio, you can bring this bot to your Zoom, create a transcript afterwards. You can have it summarize the call and just highlight the most important parts of that meeting. Text to video is new. It's generally been terrible up to now. OpenAI launched, they didn't launch. OpenAI did a demo of Sora a few weeks ago, which was amazing. They're creating one minute long videos now, which are realistic. You can't tell they're not real, just from a text prompt. That's not out yet. When it when it's out, we could talk more about it. Video to text, same thing. I can input a video and have the model describe that as text. This is just some imagery. The one on the right, is as good as any image that I've seen on the internet for a bus tour in London. It's definitely not perfect. The text on the side of the bus is bad. These things are really bad at putting text on images. Um, I think there's also no driver, but most people are never going to notice. One on the left is a bit of a joke. But th this, these are the kind of things that happen today. So you definitely can't auto-produce imagery today. It's not good enough yet. This is um, image to text. This is me just messing around when this came out, I think in September. So I just scribbled out an outline of a web page, and I made it deliberately complicated and moved things around with arrows and crossed things out. And my handwriting is definitely not very legible, but for the computer, it's fine. And it generated HTML code and made a website out of that mess on the left. That's the prompt I gave it. it took me two minutes. It produced this in in um, a few seconds. A couple of bridges, 99.9% .9 of humans would have no clue the difference between these two. This model knows it. One's in Newcastle in UK, which is where I'm from. The other one's in Sydney, Australia. It recognizes the difference between them. So this is a new product which came out from, and this is all getting to a place, I promise. This is a Facebook Ray-Bans or Meta Ray-Bans which you can buy today for $300 and you can wear these and they have a camera on the front they have a microphone on the side and they have audio on the side as well. And they have, they are connected to the internet. So they have connection to the meta large language model, the meta AI. So now potentially you're walking along, recording the world as you see it, listening to the world as you see it and you're speaking to the large language model. So potentially this is recording, and this is a little bit like a Black Mirror episode now. It's recording your life. They're not meant for that. This is not how they're selling this stuff. Well, maybe that's what it is meant for. But it's potentially recording your life. So potentially, hypothetically, you could 
turn this on all day, get home at night, and ask the LLN to summarize your day. Or maybe, hey, remember that conversation? What was that website that person mentioned? Or what was that task that somebody asked me to do that I forgot about? Or what did my wife ask me to pick up at the shop? Some basic things which are going to be quite obvious, good examples of how these things can be applied. But let me go back to data compression because I talked earlier about compressing data and viewing data and going into our heads and compressing it. Now, potentially with these sunglasses on, if you wore those all day, which is weird, but possible, everything you consume, whether you read it, whether you watch it, whether you listen to it, is going into this engine. So this becomes a human walking around, only it remembers everything and it can process everything and it can make decisions on everything. Not quite yet, but this is definitely where this stuff is going, which gets pretty scary. Agents, I talk about a lot, and I have done for, I don't know how long now, but this is definitely where we're going as well. So agents, so it's fine. I can talk to these LLMs and have conversations all day, but right now it doesn't remember anything about me. Like I said at the start, every time I converse with these things, it's forgotten who I am. But we're going to end up in this place, and we already are somewhat, where these agents are starting to know what we want. So I would program an agent for my objectives at work. So my objective is to get the most followers on Instagram for my bus tour. And I want to sell as many bus tickets as possible in San Francisco. Whatever I'm trying to do, it's going to learn my objectives. I need to create a report every month with these things, and we'll, we'll, we'll give it a list of things that we're trying to achieve. Then I'm going to go out to the world using that agent and try and find that information, trying to achieve, trying to achieve those objectives. And then maybe I'm trying to sell my bus tour to somebody at Expedia. So I, it's going to work it out. It's going to find somebody at Expedia and it's going to send someone at Expedia and say, listen, here's, here's some bus tours. Do you want to sell my bus tours? But obviously you're not going to talk to the person at Expedia. You're going to talk to the Expedia agent. So what would normally we go back and forth via email and understand what we're offering, what they are offering, and we have these conversations, which is what we do all day long via email. Our agents know all of our objectives. They're able to talk to the other person's agents, a conversation that might take us 20 or 30 emails to go backwards and forwards. These things can now do in four seconds. And it's just going to come with the result. And at the end, it's going to, at the end, it's going to say, great, we just got a new contract with Expedia, or I just created... 150 Instagram posts for the next two months. And I've programmed them all, scheduled them all. It's all done. So potentially each person has their own agent. So like I said before, with this compression, now we're consuming this data. Our agent understands that data. Our agent is able to talk to the other person's agent. Task by task, these AI models are going to take over and enable us to do other things which the AI can't. So who knows where this stuff's going to go, but it's going to go in that direction. I'm pretty sure we're all going to have agents and our agents will be talking to other agents. Definitely a lot of tasks are going to disappear. I like to think of tasks rather than jobs because most jobs are made up of lots of different types of tasks and it's really going to replace task by task more than take out a whole job. So I think it's for us as humans to work out which tasks are going to be replaced by these things and then for us to work on the stuff that we should be working on which the computer can't for now anyway point is this stuff is is done it's not going to stop it's been released there's going to be no pause on development this stuff's out there the biggest companies in the world which are except for apple who knows what apple are doing but amazon google meta microsoft are all going all in on this AI stuff. So it is going to move ahead and it's going to move faster and faster. The faster these chips get, and these chips are not, there was a thing called Moore's law where the processing power would, um, would, would double every one and a half years or something. I just saw a thing today that it's going to be a thousand times, the chips are a thousand times faster than they were 10 years ago now. So the faster these things are, the faster they get because they're using the chips to, create chips they're using the ai to create the next chips so this stuff's not going to slow down if you're not using this your competitors are still using this so you're going to start falling behind your competition if you're not using this technology so i think it's important to learn 
how it works, learn how, where it doesn't work, and then learn the best way to use these tools in your in your business. There's a lot of gotchas out there, especially reporters. They love to show where their stuff doesn't work. They love to do the itinerary and show you how it messed up on the itinerary in San Francisco and how dumb the AI is. Tons of press around the images and how to create these faulty historical images. And it's easy to point at that stuff and say, look, there's proof AI doesn't work. But those are just small examples. For 99% of the stuff, it does a really good job and it's improving day after day. So this is the, as everyone says, this is the worst that AI is ever going to be. There's no point in saying AI doesn't work. AI can't do this. AI can't do that. Focus on the things that it can do and where it can help you rather than trying to point out the things that it can't. It's fun to point out where it fails and where it doesn't do a good job, but that's not going to help you. It's not going to not create better content than humans. If you're a writer, you need to think about that. You, you, you can keep trying to defend your, your position, but we don't sit there and say, I can do numbers better than a computer anymore. Nobody says that. And unfortunately, that's what humans tend to do. We tend to try to defend our turf and defend our corner. And we used to be better than computers at numbers. And we used to be better than computers at language. And none of, now, today, none of those things are true. So in the future, I think AI gets integrated into everything. So we're going to talk less about AI, and it's just going to become part of our normal everyday lives. Like instead of auto-complete, it'll be auto-generate the full email. Agents are going to be happening. Auto GPT, I haven't really talked about, but that's where the computer, instead of doing one prompt, one task at a time, you'll be able to say, listen, go and create my social media strategy, and it will just go and create all these tasks using different models and come back with a completed task. That's also happening as well. That's it. I hope I didn't talk too long, long-winded, but that's it for part one. I'll record part two very soon, and thanks for listening.